नमस्कार इंडिया इज वन ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट डेमोक्रेसीज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड एंड अमेरिका द ओल्डेस्ट एंड इट्स आर एक्सट्रीम प्रिवलेज टुडे दैट ऑन द यूथ फोरम वी हैव विद अस ऑडियंसेस रिप्रेजेंटेटिव्स फ्रॉम बोथ इंडिया एंड अमेरिका वेलकम एवरीवन स्पेशली आवर गेस्ट फ्रॉम द कोलगेट यूनिवर्सिटी फ्रॉम द यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका अ वार्म वेलकम टू एवरीवन बट इन मॉडर्न टाइम्स वी हैव सीन देयर इज अ विजिबल डिमांड टू हैव मोर एक्टिव पार्टिसिपेशन टुवर्ड्स गवर्नेंस व्हाई इज इट दैट इंपॉर्टेंट what are the ways by which citizens can get themselves involved in a democratic setup to put these things into perspective we have with us a very elite panel please welcome professor bb bhattacharya he is the vice chancellor with a very prestigious jawaharlal nehru university professor a warm welcome and also very happy to have with us professor timothy burns he is a professor of political science with the colgate university thank you so much sir for coming in Let me ask the people first because we're talking about your participation in governance. Elias, your first trip to India. Tell us something about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Elias. I am a first year at Colgate University, and uh, my classmates and I have traveled here as part of a program we're in for global engagement to try to learn as much as we can about India and its people and its culture. What's your first impression about India? India is an amazing place. I mean, wow! You read so much about you know about another country in books, but it's something so different to experience it firsthand. So it's better than what you expected. Oh, much better, and the food is great, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Diana Stevens. I'm also from Colgate University. Your impressions about India? Um, it's it's very dense. There's so many people, and they're everywhere, and interacting with each other, and interacting with us. It's uh, it's really amazing. Do you okay, think? your impressions about your first visit to India? It's it's so amazing. <laughs> like, What's the food like, Elias, or anything else? The the food, the the architecture is so beautiful. Um, <laughs> the weather we're getting used to, but um. Your experiences so far in our country? Um, I I've really enjoyed every aspect. The people here are wonderful. And you have studied as a student of political science, um, Indian culture as well. Mm -hmm. So, what's your take on Indian culture, the global culture? How is it different from U.S. culture? Um, I think that it's much more diverse. There are a lot of different aspects that um, in America aren't present. There are so many different cultures within India, different languages, different religions um, that just aren't there in the United States. And so it's really interesting to see how India melds together. And how did this uh, subject, knowing about India culture, enrich your career? Um, Well, it's just as far as uh, I am a political science major, and knowing as much about global cultures makes me uh, more prepared to deal with political issues at home and abroad. What is it that you expect from this trip? I just, I really want to get a feel for the culture. You can only read so much in textbooks and learning, but actually coming in, experiencing, I think, is a unique experience. Your experiences about India? India's been great. Uh, it's been really crazy to go through the streets and. Definitely a different kind of driving here than we see in the United States. So you do not sure. want to go back to the U.S. now, right? <laughs> never, never. <laughs> I'm Haley. Yeah, Haley. Good. Hey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, and I'm from Colgate, and um, so far in India, it's been amazing. The driving gets some taking used to, but um, and Fab India is amazing. people's participation towards effective governance that's the topic for discussion today in any democracy we have seen traditionally people do vote they pay taxes that's how they associate themselves with governance so what are your expectations from the government um well i guess i expect the government to take care of its people to provide infrastructure um to provide schools and healthcare and things like that um that are vital for people to survive and do you think they live up to the expectation of the people i think they do i think there are lots of improvements to still be made so i try to get involved Uh, as i can with that how do you get involved well i um i call my congressman every time um there's a bill that need that i'm that i'm involved in or that i that i'm interested in um for example the healthcare bill i i called uh, my congressman my senator about that so the senator are approachable straight away a call coming from you yes um i mean they have uh, assistants to answer their phones for them but i but they definitely listen to our opinions okay that's very nice anyone else would like to share such experiences hi i'm brianna crusoe also from colgate university 
Um, I've been more involved with campaigning. Uh, for example, in the last presidential campaign, I made phone calls on behalf of the candidate that I was supporting for the campaign. And I know that I've been uh, pretty involved in some of the more local mayoral elections. And it's very exciting to be able to be a part of your democracy. It makes you feel like you're involved, that your voice is being heard, and that you have some power to actually make a difference. Okay, so is it involvement about elections? What about involvement after you've got the people winning? Hi, I'm Julia McMillan. I'm also from Colgate. Um, the One of the things that the current government does really well is send out emails saying, here's, what's bill, here's a bill that's coming up click this button, go online, sign a petition to support it. So they make it so easy that uh, it's, it's almost hard to not support something and get really involved. Um, and also, um, especially in college where there's so many groups on campus, I was just in a group that um, did a letter writing campaign where we wrote the letters about human rights violations and then had people sign them and send them to their Congress men and senators. The participation starts from the college or the school. You, if you participate there, you'll participate for your for I, a broader nation as well. I think definitely. And being on a college where everyone cares so much, um, and that just gets us really motivated to do okay. things. Do you actively, consciously do something for the community, for the nation, for the world? Um, when I was in high school, I was part of Amnesty International, which is a club that gets together and writes letters and petitions the government to help um, fix human rights violations we see around the world and ever since I've gotten to college I've tried to go out and experience as much as I can and okay so please involved. pass on the mic we've been getting a sense that people are participating but would you say there is a need for more participation towards governance and what's your name uh, my name is Danny and I would I would say definitely because I have like we are all in a very prominent liberal arts college and of course we <laughs> participate a lot but there's a lot of people like a lot of my friends at home don't vote and would never really think about voting. So I think it's good to like bring it from our campus back to the communities where we live and get like our communities to participate more. And when I was in uh, high school, we did that. We, I was part of a group that we went out and to people's houses and to get them to vote, not just one party. And like we provided rides to elderly, elderly and disabled people to the voting centers so they could vote. Okay, excellent. Raise your hand who does not vote. I assume everybody is eligible to vote. Anyone who's not voted? Okay, Danny votes, she doesn't. What's your message to her? Uh, everyone's vote matters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pass on the mic. Any specific reason for you not to vote? I have just turned 18. So oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. No specific but from here on, would you vote? Yeah, sure. And apart from voting, what are the other areas you look forward to be part of the governance? Well, I would say in India, there's no effective uh, infrastructure or effective uh, procedure through which we youngsters can participate. The only thing is through voting. Uh, well, I would say that apart from voting, youngsters engage themselves in politi uh, politics at school level and at college level. Like in universities across India, we have a students union which form a direct link with the governance in India. But again, this is limited to those set of youth, those, those set of young people who engage themselves in full-fledged politics. Another thing is RTI. Okay. That is the Right to Information Act. Because we can engage ourselves in the governance uh, by knowing what the government goes through what the government, how the government functions. So okay, in the governance. let's get uh, the people in the first row also engaged in this conversation. What um, about governance? Especially recently, uh, President Obama, especially in his campaign, has done a good job engaging the youth um, and providing ways for every person to, to make a small difference. I think that's sometimes the issue is that people are too, they get too lazy or just don't think that they can do something. Um, and so sometimes they need a little guidance to show them how they even just a small thing can make a huge difference. So yes, we can. And y yes, you did made Obama the president. <laughs> but, but after that, once you ensure somebody takes the seat as youngsters, do you follow that the campaign promises are met? Um, I think that some of them have been made, but I think we have to give him time. I'm, I'm optimistic that he's going to follow through on a lot of the things that he said. I mean, obviously, campaign promises are campaign promises, but um, I'm optimistic. I would say. Um, the Democratic National Convention actually came to my hometown um, when Obama was campaigning, and it was amazing because uh, he spoke in front of thousands of people in this um, in our football arena, and it was just amazing to see how many people were touched by him and how many people were there to support him from all walks of life. So it was it's pretty interesting. Okay, so Haley, what about paying taxes? You pay taxes? No. <laughs> Is it because you earn income? 
I um, babysit, so <laughs> I don't earn that kind of income that deserves taxes. Okay. One of the other ways you can um, get associated with the governance, yes, please identify yourself. Yeah. I'm Max Cohen Green. I'm also from Colgate University. Um, I think one of the most important things to recognize is that while many people get involved in the campaign, um, I'm sure most of the people who actually did uh, campaign for President Obama didn't actually register, aren't didn't actually vote in the recent primaries in most of their states. Which is a fault. What you say is, is a mistake. Sir, then. absolutely. Um, and did I think you vote? Um, yes, I did vote three days ago in an absentee ballot. Do you pay taxes, Max? Yes, I do pay taxes. Anything, you don't do anything wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm not perfect, but um, I think it's very easy to um, you know, send out an email. It's very easy to click a link or um, tell someone to vote for somebody, but to actually press the system to work is very, very different. Right. Um, and I think at a certain point, uh, Americans are very apathetic. We only have about a 50%, less than 50% of eligible voters actually vote. Um, and that's a problem. Okay. Now, for addressing problems, we need solutions as well. Um, I'm Maggie. I'm also from Colgate University. Um, America's youth, and as well as any youth, is really a force to be reckoned with when empowered. And um, as you can see with the youth movement that we saw in Obama's election, um, every vote matters. And it's very important to encourage your friends to, to take that same And mentality. Maggie does that. Yes. <laughs> okay, congratulations, Maggie. I'm Amelia. I'm from Colgate University as well. And apart from studying, what all do you enjoy? What do I enjoy? Apart from studying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't enjoy studying? Well, I enjoy other things besides <laughs> studying. <laughs> but you studied Indian culture. Mm -hmm. What's your view on Indian culture? Um, my view, I mean, what we really focused on in the course that we took on India is uh, the great amount of diversity that's present in India. And what I think is interesting is that uh, to compare that there's, I mean, the USA is often thought of to be a huge melting pot and there's lots of different types of people. And so it's interesting to think of India as sort of a similar type of melting pot because before learning about India, I really didn't know. And, you know, you kind of think that everyone's all the same, but really there are lots of people with all different backgrounds. And I think that's kind of interesting. To so learn. as a citizen, what participation would you want for effective governance? Um, well, obviously, the more people participate, the better. I think the most important is like educating people about this. Okay. Um, because I mean, until you learn more about it, you don't really know how to get involved. So, like in involving people in schools from early ages, understanding more about the government, I think that's the best way to get people okay. involved. Okay, and in, in its own little way, that's our objective as well on the Youth Express today to bring about awareness and educate. I'm going to come back to hear the remaining voices as well. But let me come back to our guest, Professor Bhattacharya. You've heard the opinions out here. Your reaction? Well, there as free and vocal like typical Indian university students. <laughs> well, since I'm familiar with US universities, their students are in fact far more sensitive than the average citizens. Average American citizens is a very quiet person. You see the vibration only in the universities, campuses. The youngsters are very vibrating. And there are lots of similarities between U.S. and India, the media is very vocal, media is very colorful. The, they don't mind telling their professors on the face what they think of them, Okay. like the Indian <laughs> students do sometimes. Hmm? They don't mind telling their presidents, if they happen to meet, what they think about him. Or So they're very free society, the Americans, sir. And uh, Indians and Americans typically get along very well. Okay, we can see that camaraderie here as well. Professor Timothy, <laughs> what's, what are the things that these students have t told you directly? Uh, many of the students from the U.S. said something that's really interesting, that the Obama campaign yes. a year and a half ago really made a huge effort to connect with young people where young people are, right? The old saying, you have to go where the voters are. Well, they're on the Internet. So that's where he found them. And he went to social networking sites and created this Obama for America campaign. But I think a few of the things the students said were important. One is that you have to vote in elections when Obama is not running. Right? <laughs> in the United States, we have a lot of elections. And so you need to vote in the elections when it's not a huge presidential What's the election. average turnout there in elections in the states? Uh, for a presidential election, it's between 50 and 60 percent. And but in the congressional party? election, it's much less. Much that's less. the problem. And it's much less. And it's about that in Same India as well. Yeah, and that's why I was listening with interest that they all said they voted because in India unfortunately youngsters in big cities don't vote this time you remember there was a campaign made 
that the youngsters should be more conscious about their political rights, but they didn't actually vote in the same way. I hope you're all speaking the truth that you actually <laughs> voted. <laughs> okay? But, uh, Professor, you mentioned about uh, Obama's campaign and how he engaged the youth using the technology. Do you think the potential that the ICT has to offer, the Information Communication Technology Age, has been unlocked fully, optimally? Uh, not fully or optimally, because I think none of us know what that is, right? Whether it's in politics or anything else. Well, let me quote you an example. Say, if you would like to increase that 50% turnout to 1,800, is <coughs> online voting permissible in U.S.? Is it existent? Uh, no. There are a few places in a couple of states, someone may know, I don't think Oregon or something has certain ways of voting. Most of our country is not online voting. But, Professor, is that part of the problem? Actually, We're not using Indian the technology. The voting system is now far more advanced than American voting system. Most of Can you believe? They still have manual counting. And that's what led to the decisive decisions between Bush. Remember that? Yeah, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> India, we have moved far ahead of that. But we can, we, can, we, say, can mm. we say that people are wanting to engage themselves with the governance, but uh, they need more forums, Professor? They do need more forums, but I think the forums are available, as the students were saying. I think. Uh, one of the students said there is a lot of apathy about politics. We get a lot of excitement when we have a presidential election, and then people go back to their day-to-day -day lives, leaving politics and political decisions to politicians, as this young woman said, <laughs> and people who are very interested, right? People who really pay attention to a sp sp specific issue can have a lot of influence because the general public has moved on to their other interests. So let's move on to the general public once again. Your views, ma'am, on governance. As I am a journalism student, so I think that, yes, this is also a way to reach the government. Yes, like people can write articles, can write, you know, there's an open paper, meaning open page for like a letter to the editor. One of the other ideas possibly could be you could write a letter to the editor. That's part of engaging yourself with the governance. Anything innovative you've done on those lines? I also, as Diane has said earlier, I have made calls to my congressman about certain bills that I would like to get passed. So the MPs, the senators are approachable, you're saying? Yes. I think sometimes we don't. There is a, a degree of apathy. So, um... In high school, I was an intern for my state assemblyman, and um, he his district covered some very poor cities and some very wealthy cities. But um, voter turnout was lower in the in the poorer cities, so we went door to door, knocking on people's doors, and um, we just raised issues and such as drugs and gangs and try to get them to be more aware of issues. Okay, that's city. a very important point, Professor Timothy. She raises: Is there a difference in approach? of how you govern for a poor city to a rich city and therefore the participation changes. Yes, the participation changes enormously. I wonder if it's true in India, but in the United States, participation rates in all forms of political participation are lower in the, in the poorer communities. And so the political system is left to people with resources to drive it, and therefore the interests of the poor are not as well represented. And what about Indian landscape, especially the urban versus rural? Does that make the difference? Well, there is one fundamental difference between interactive democracy in U.S. and India. In U.S., democracy is far more interactive at the local governance level. They all take very active interest in issues of local governance, the city council, the county houses, even the small village community. Whereas in India, the local governance interaction is generally much less. People are far more interested and concerned about the national level issues. So we have far more bigger representation of the national level movement in capital, media, talking about the national issues. But Professor, we do have Gram Sabhas, we do have Gram Panchayat. Yes, but unfortunately, they typically end up with elections, except in few states and few centers. Because we don't have that kind of mechanism, like the local governments, they interact telephonically uh, through internet, through communication, smaller distances. So I would say local governments, India must learn more from US. Okay. But the national level, I think Indians are far more proactive than the US. Okay, so there's a difference between the local and national governance. Yes, your views? I think there's a, a very big difference between local and national government. I think that uh, most people would associate themselves with the national government, but the local government, most people can't name the names of their assemblymen or their congressmen or anybody that I guess would directly matter more in a daily life. And um, I think that's, like Tim was saying, I think that the interests of the people need to be uh, more represented as, uh, you know, as the governments grow. I think that people need to understand why and who and what. I think that's really important. Okay, so David, would you say we would know the name of the senator, but uh, we would also know the name of the local 
local politician and would you approach him as well for for a community issue yeah i think that i think that it's almost more important to contact the people that uh, live in your area and have and work the, in the same uh, sectors as you do because i think that they will understand they'll have a the ability to identify with uh, with your with you or your issue a little bit better than somebody who um, lives in a larger city that's miles and miles away. Okay. What are your expectations from effective government? I'm Gretel. I'm also from Colgate University, and my expectations is just that the government keeps things running smoothly. So, are you willing to be part of effective governance? I am not as actively participating as everyone else is, but. Um, Yes, it oh. is important to participate. Okay, big round of applause for her. Very candid confession there. <laughs> <laughs> well, ma'am, your coming here on this show shows that you want uh, effective governance, and that also is your participation. Yes, the one who hasn't voted so far, please. We are not directly linked. We keep on sending them letters, contacting them, the uh, main uh, MCD officers or whatever, the um, main officers, but they do not listen. Uh, there is in entire laxity on part of the politicians at the local governments, at the national governments, there is no direct contact. So you give away or you go back to them or you go to the next level? I, I just try, uh, try doing uh, my part. Uh, honestly, the rest depends on them. Okay, so they don't listen once, you come back and watch a movie and enjoy cricket. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Majority of people who do not vote are the educated class. So I would like to ask you, like uh, even you mentioned like 50 to 60 percent is the voting in USA. In India, it was identified because uh, that people don't vote majorly because they think that every politician is the same. Why would the educated not vote? Well, it is a phenomenon we have been discussing it. But on the contrary, educated in India is far more vocal in interacting with the media, expressing their opinion, often coming in the streets, in the public demonstrations, raising issues. But somehow, as this young lady has said, some indifference seen in the educated mind that uh, the representatives <coughs> they don't often behave differently and even if you do get them elected there is a detachment after the election between the elected representatives and common citizens until the next round of election comes and that's natural the and detachment? that is a phenomenon in India so younger people have somewhat I mean, detachment to the politics. They believe, oh, it's not for us. So they will be vocal in expressing in the media, but directly coming into the politics in India for the youth is becoming not so common. But uh, Professor Timothy, all the initiatives that have taken place uh, as of now, which encourages people's participation towards effective governance, if they have failed, if they've been unsuccessful, and there has been a loss of faith in citizens, <coughs> how to restore that? Well, I think it's the most important thing in talking about the professor was saying is to organize. That people have to organize. If you call your congressman, that's a good thing. But the more organized you are, I'm going to say the word over and over again, the more organized groups are, the, they are growing together into a group where they meet and they might actually charge dues and they, they get, make themselves into a kind of an institutional player in politics so the politicians have to so, respond So you're saying that. social clubs, institutionalization of representation. Exactly, so that when they call the Congress and they're not just saying that I, Tim, want you to do this, but I speak for a large number of people in your constituency who want you to but respond But Professor Timothy, if you ask these young people who are studying right now in Colgate University to form these clubs and institutionalize, they're going to spend time, they're going to spend their money and energy. What incentive would you give to them? Would they have any incentive? They would not. Yeah, I, this is a, a depressing point. I wonder what the young people think. One of the reasons that young people aren't organized is that they don't stay young. It's the only group in society where it's very difficult to organize. It's very difficult. To, it's easy to or, organize the elderly because once you're old, you stay old. But young people stop <laughs> being young. So the interests that are most important to young people never really get addressed because the young people keep getting older. But the issues which are young also remain young. They need to mature. They need to fructify. Professor Bhattacharya, do you think we've got enough incentives today in place which will encourage the young and the old alike to participate in governance? Professor Burns have said young people have diversified interests. They're building up their career. This is one of the many issues which is exciting them. They may not stay in the local area. They might raise an issue once and they're moving out. They're building the career. They're more concerned about their future and career. The older people, settled people in the local area, the state, they have a stake in the local issues. So they show more 
uh, interest in solving the local issues at local level. You recall about a year and a half ago, after the big terrorist attack in Mumbai, in Mumbai, college students went and organized lots of activities, but they believed that their job was ended, over with that. They just talked in the media, they did some public uh, demonstration procession, and the job is done. Now it is up to the electorate to take over. There is no continuity from that on that we should see to it that the movement which we started actually results in some concrete actions. Right. And that is what is lacking in Indian youth. Okay, since you mentioned terrorism, now we all agree <coughs> that the scourge of terrorism has impacted the US and India. What is your thought? Uh, I think the main indifference in among the youth towards our politicians is because of the way the politician is projected in the society. He is viewed as this uh, manipulative being who will do anything. He will lie, cheat and plunder to achieve his ends. So similarly, in a case of terrorism, the reaction to a terrorist attack, it seems very well rehearsed and orchestrated. He is uh, putting up demonstrations and uh, organizing campaigns as if he is uh, trying to establish his base in society rather than do any actual good. Okay. Yeah, pass on the mic down below in the middle line. Hi, I'm Charlie. I'm from Kogi University. And I think especially with terrorism, there's definitely, and as well as healthcare and all these things, there needs to be um, more collective action. There needs to be, like as Tim was saying, there needs groups need to be formed in order to, in the case of terrorism, thwart these attacks that are becoming more and more prevalent, or less, if you, if you see it that way. But um, especially with those views, you just need to like organize, you need to form groups. Would you say that you know what you want from the government? I actually think that we aren't clear, and to agree with Max, there is a general sort of apathy, and I think one of the greatest problems is that people get engaged with issues that are raised in the United States after a bill is already passed, and you seem to be shocked by things that are moving through Congress, and for instance, the health care bill, a lot of people did not become involved in its creation and its components until after the bill was created. and. I think one of the most important things to get people involved is to get them interested before the bill is passed to contact their congressmen and senators and then once they would influence the process rather than the after effects. So you're saying that we need to tell people, make them aware that a particular bill, if it goes on to become legislation, affects our lives. So better give your inputs right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Let's. Sir. I think here uh, comparing with India, uh, Indian system better chimps in because, uh, you know, America has only fixed line of authority. Either you are democratic or you are republic. In India, you have at least one political system who is against the bill. So they will go on the public and tell them what are the ill effects. But what about the citizen? Are citizen empowered in both the countries? I associate myself with a site. Uh, there is a site called Jagore, which is sponsored by Tata I tried to associate with that. I tried to volunteer for things. I tried to uh, bring things in the mainstream, probably. Okay. I tried to do my bit. How much of these advertisements that come on television, which ask the citizen to enlighten, to be awake, be participative in governance. Do they create an impact or is it just that one time you see this ad and the next moment it's off your head? Uh, I think these ads do create an awareness among the youth. Uh, I mean, I give you my example itself. Uh, I didn't have a voter card and the day I saw the ad, I told my dad, you know, please get my voter ID card. I don't have it. I want to vote now. Okay. So you I got the ID card now? Yeah, I got and it. And unlike yeah. her, you'll vote? Yeah. I okay. <laughs> Everyone will. We've talked about taxation. We've talked about voting. She mentioned about writing an article to the editor. What are the other areas you could actually endorse? Any ideas of how we can participate more? Um, well, I was going to comment. Um, I know that in the United States, there's two main parties. And, and often, oftentimes, um, people feel like they have to vote along party lines. And in that way, they give up some of their other um, beliefs. Like if they have one belief that isn't consistent with one party, they'll just let it go and vote for the person that might contradict them in that way. And I know that in, the, that in India there's a lot of different parties, so I was wondering if that affects um, the way people feel like they're represented. Like, do, they, do Indians feel like they're better represented because they can more accurately choose a politician who represents their views? Okay. Professor Bhattacharya, should we vote for the party or for the person, irrespective of the party? Debate going on in India quite some time. You know, there are different countries. Scandinavian countries have the proportional representation plus individual. In India, we have been doing it for individual. So is in USA. You vote for an individual. Though in the background, you keep the person in the uh, midst of his policies of the party and all that. But ideally, <coughs> it should be a combination of the both. Party is equally important are issues. Individual is equally important. What kind of person is going to represent you? Because the most important thing in politics <laughs> is politicians before getting election, whether in USA or in India, makes one kind of promise. 
and then is often changing the views after representation. Now, what right do you have to force that politician to say, look here, you got our mandate promising to do this. You have failed to do this. Now, the only chance you have is after next election. But you don't have a chance to force him during the period. Look, this is the mandate on which you got elected. You better legislate for that. Neither in US nor in India you have this power right now. But uh, Professor Timothy, <coughs> what will trigger the change? How to bridge that gap between those who are governed and, and the public? I think one thing in the United States that gets a lot of attention is the role of money in politics. And we don't have public financing of campaigns. We have individual private financing of campaigns. So there's a big movement in the United States and many young people, there's a large group at Colgate that fights on this question to try to get a more even distribution of money. Because you were mentioning advertisements to encourage people to participate. But also, I don't know about in India, but in the United States, we have a flood of advertisements for candidates themselves. <laughs> vote for this person, vote for this person, like they were a can of soda of a box of soap. And so the more that is evened out, then the more other people can participate. But uh, does those advertisements uh, impress, uh, you know, does that influence your decision, the impressionable minds? Yes, the advertisements do influence. Why? Because every, we cannot approach single person, single, single individual, we cannot approach. So those advertisements, you know, they make mass awareness. In the U.S. The campaign, a lot of the politicians are like, this person's bad, vote for me instead. And I think it's, it's really horrible. It's just all slandering. And also, they speak about, they speak about the issues and they say, this politician's going to vote for this and this is bad because of this. And a lot of times, they're not presenting the law or the bill that's proposed in the right way. So Americans get this idea in their mind of this is what the law means, when really it doesn't mean that at all. And so I think that Americans decide that because they saw a campaign, they don't need to go research, because they saw an ad, they don't need to research the topic, and they think they know about it, when really, oftentimes, they don't, and then they vote based on misinformed decisions. Okay, what are the topics that interest you, that you want the government to focus on? <coughs> Is it education that the youth really want government to do more on? Um, I think, uh, I don't know, I guess healthcare has been a really big thing just because it's been in the news so much. And that's what about what, job security? Um, I, I mean, I guess I should care about job security because I'm going to graduate soon. But right now, I'm in college, so I guess I haven't really thought about that. But you think once you graduate, there will be enough jobs in the market, not worried much? Um, I'm just going to go to med school and <laughs> fry it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll cross the bridge when it comes, ma'am. Uh, what's your take on governance and your role in that? Uh, well, I'm, I've been pretty involved so far in my life in uh, my local and even national um, governance. But um, I do think that some of the issues that President Obama addressed in his campaign haven't yet been addressed in his <coughs> presidency, but of course it is still early. So you keep a tab. On, yes. on how much I think, <laughs> how much the progress has become, right? Yes, but I don't I don't feel that enough Americans are doing that. I think that um, as many people have already stated, you vote and you just sort of hope that it all works out. So do you think some other system should come in place, say a mid appraisal kind of thing where youth gets to voice their concerns? I would love to see something like that because I often f uh, feel that politicians start to sort of follow up on their promises as the next election comes around because they they're hoping to be reelected but oftentimes in the in the middle of their terms they're just sort of doing whatever they want and it doesn't necessarily uh, follow with what they promised and i've i do feel some sort of lack of power during that sort of interim period where you can you can make lots of phone calls you can tell them you know i would like you to vote this way right. but I, I don't feel like there is enough power to really make sure that they're following through on what your expecta okay. expectations were okay we're talking about people's participation for effective governance because that impacts us anyone here in the audience who believes well i need to concentrate on my studies my homely chores my office and let the people who are specialists in governing, govern, you know, whatever I say will not make a difference. I spend um, a lot of time doing my best to understand certain political issues. Um, I read a lot, um, the newspapers, books, whatever it is, but I still only understand, you know, one one thousandth of what <laughs> is actually going on. Um, so when I think about uh, people voting in the United States or in India, if I were to be working nine to five and I have three kids to feed, um, I have other things to do. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so my question for um, the professors over here is, in India or in America, do you have faith in the American voter that they truly understand, or do you think that they're too susceptible um, to being played on their passions, just pure demagoguery or populism or wherever it is? Professor Bhattacharya, you first. As the first principle of economics says, we take a decision knowing consciously what benefit it is going to give it to us. The average citizen is supposed to ask, these are the critical issues facing my society, my government. I want someone to represent on these issues that will maximize my welfare. But it's all unfortunately remain more in the textbook, both in economics and political theory, than in practice. And this is something, but then what is alternative? You see, as they say, the best defense of the present system of democracy is there is no better alternative. Until you have a better alternative, you have to live with the present system, try to make it a smaller improvement in the present system, because the alternatives are far worse. Yes, you are right, as she has said, after you get a candidate, not merely the President Obama, what about your senator or congressman or the local govern uh, governance man? What the promise before the election, and do they deliver? Now, public memory is very short. It's a rare citizen who would be asking, look, Mr. Representative, last time, four years ago, getting votes from us, you promised this. Would you please tell us how much of these promises you have fulfilled? Right. It would be a rare citizen ever asking such questions. And that's what the average typical politicians know. But how do we get that forum? Because after that, where do we question them that you've not fulfilled this promise? Well, we have to evolve a system like they have now a presidential debate. Okay. And there'll be question based. Experts will come prepared. Look here, this is what your agenda is, what you mean. In India, we don't have this kind of a system of debate. But there is a media. Media is supposed to remember Look, this is what you have promised five years ago. Please tell to the citizen, what have you done of this? Why you could not implement this? We don't ask such questions. We are, in that respect, somewhat more polite, maybe somewhere less concerned. About. We are concerned as well at the same time, Professor Burns. Do you think the curriculum that's being taught in any university, Colgate or any university, is such which talks about the practical aspects so you can, you can understand your nation and the world better? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. We tried to do so at Colgate. Certainly many of these students who have taken classes have done so. I have to say that I agree with Max a little bit, but I don't think it's that hard <laughs> To know, I mean, there are a lot of details, but it's not that hard to know whether you're in this direction or in that direction. And I think something the professor said earlier is very important. In the United States, we have very locally based politics, geographically locally based. And that's good in a way that you know who your representative is, but it's bad in a way that we have very weak national parties. So people are always running around trying to figure out what does this senator think? What does that congressman think? Where it might be better to say, what does the Democratic Party think? Or what does the Republican Party think? Or what does the third party think? So you're saying think? it's party first. Yeah, well, it makes it easier for the voter to sort of generally feel, I'm going in this direction or not. Because if Max has his three children and his job and he's busy, he's not <laughs> going to be able to find out what these particular people think in their minds. But he certainly would be able to know which party he supports. And it might also help him to hold their feet to the fire later to say, I voted for this as a party platform or a party position. Why has hasn't this institution responded to But one needs. other thing we are witnessing in India, a change that has happened, if you see a lot of youngsters are embracing politics. We've got a lot of young MPs at 26, at 27. Um, is the same happening in America, youngsters taking on politics as a career? Well, um, only very rarely. I mean, we have a, a constitutional provision. You have to be 25 to be in the House of Representatives. <laughs> we always have a couple of young ones. But I'm sure our students would say most of our politicians seem to be of the older variety. OK, David, how about becoming a young politician? <laughs> Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, for a point, <laughs> when I was uh, when I was 16 years old, I actually worked for the United States Congress as Excellent. a congressional page, and at well, the that time, deserves a round of applause, though. Thank, thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. So, what did you do as a 16-year-old? What did well, you do? Um, I I was essentially an errand boy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's putting it very lightly. Okay. But uh, essentially, um, we were the youngest employees of the government at the time, and. What we did is that if a congressman had a paper that he wanted to give to another congressman, uh, we, would pay, we would walk to the office, 
pick up the paper and then bring it to the other congressman's office and have them sign off. It was really simple. But, um, <laughs> and after that, you've continued that, say, even after your graduation, would you probably go back to play some more active role in politics? Well, I would hope so. But I think it's very hard to get in to the system. I think that a lot of what I saw was a lot of people who knew each other, and it was, it was all based on who you know and not... Uh, I guess your ability per se. Okay. And I, I actually want to comment on something that Tim said about the the different parties. Yes. Um, when I when I worked, I actually worked on the House of Representatives floor, and I was surprised. It was during the election year, and I was surprised about the the sheer volume of uh, renaming post offices, the type of bills they went through. They wanted to rename post offices. And Why would they do that? I have, I've, I've been trying to figure it out for like two and a half years. Okay, <laughs> Professor Timothy? We have a system which incentivizes politicians to pay attention to very local interests, which are often very limited in nature, to provide some sort of pork, we call it, to the people in their district. Okay, apart from David, anyone else who's interested in politics? Um, I think in America it's very interesting that you can be involved in politics on an issue base uh, through interest groups, and you could go and you could be very involved in politics, maybe if you're your biggest issue is the environment. You could join an environmental group like the Sierra Club and lobby um, with the government and try to get environmental initiatives passed. Okay. Or if for almost any issue, there's an interest group that you can work with the government. So if you have a strong interest in one thing, you can get a lot done in that okay, one. Okay, so from interest group, you're probably running for presidency one day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Environment, any other issue that concerns you? There are a lot of inadequacies in the American education system, um, especially the disparities between the education that is provided to um, l students from lower income families because of the way that it's set up is that um, do you your school the amount of money your school gets is based on how much money your parents make and that makes um, education very unequal in the country and and, and um, continues uh, perpetuates the system of more pe people from lower classes staying in the lower classes and people in the higher classes staying in the higher classes. And I think that's an issue that definitely needs reform in America. Okay. Professor Bhattacharya, how would you ensure there are forums where they come and speak as well so that the Prime Minister and the Presidents and the Senators can hear them? It's uh, difficult because in a country like India with 1.2 billion population, the top national level politicians would perhaps have a very limited time to come and interact. Occasionally they do in some select gatherings. But to go across the niche for 1.2 billion people would be very difficult. But using but of technology? We don't as yet have in India the internet uh, communications between citizens and the politicians, which is Europe has become now very, very effective. In fact, the politicians are using increasingly in internet responding directly to the voters and citizens queries and views India it has not yet picked up to that extent the only other alternative is forum like this but do prestigious universities like the Colgate the Jawaharlal Nehru University become voice of the voiceless do you do you bridge the gap well I had the university which is the most vocal so it is not a typical representative university there every week we should have a couple of national level political leaders interacting with my students. So that's not the, but the issue is at the national level. The one issue I thought I have raising it, the idea came, would you join the politics? And I think one of you mentioned that it is difficult to get into the system. It is not that absolutely free entry. Both India and USA, the dynastic politics is becoming the norm. You must belong to a family of politics at the young age or you have to struggle a lot to create your own base. But so your question was, will the young join? Youth can join if you have a family connection, both in USA and in India. You know certain family name associated with certain political ideas and values. So for an average young boy, Obama is an exception. That's why Obama is a sea change. Question is, is it the trend continuing in future for USA or it will be a one shot affair? I would like to hear these youngsters. Yes. Are you all aspiring to be a future Obama? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I would love to go into politics someday. Um, but I do see a lot of that, um, like the Bushes, for instance, um, with the Republican Party and the Udalls. They're another political family in the United States. Um, but I think that. Um, more and more it is new faces are popping up in politics in the United States and although I think that 
that family dynasty dynamic still exists, I think that it's getting a little better. And I don't know about in India if it's the same way. But now, is Obama phenomenon going to inspire more and more of youngsters? Um, I think it's inspired me a lot, personally. I can't speak for everyone here. Okay, but, okay it inspires yeah. you. Matter what about you? Are you inspired? Yeah, I think that Obama proves that the American system can be a meritocracy. Um, and if you have the networking, networking abilities, which are necessary as a politician anyway, because you're having to deal with so many people, it's not as if the, these communication abilities are a negative thing. Um, but if, if you have these abilities to network with other people, and if you have the vision and the eloquence and all these characteristics that are important as a politician, I definitely think that uh, you can succeed in politics, and Obama's really proven that, and I think that's going to increase over time. Okay, there's going to be problems with any nation, challenges with any nation. So, say for example, economic recession or any other air issues with environment. Do you do you think the citizens have the technical knowledge to participate in governance and give opinions on all these issues? I don't know if they have the technical knowledge, but I think that a lot of it has to do with being informed, and I think that. Um, as the young lady on the end said, um, being a journalism student, the media can play a large role in informing the public about those types of issues. And I don't think that it necessarily has to be, I think that a full knowledge of the issues is necessary for the public to Okay, engage. the lady right behind you. I think he's really inspirational. I think it is interesting that he doesn't come from family with politicians and it does show that anybody can do whatever they need to do. Okay, and uh, what has been your association with governance so far? Um, I voted in the last election, and I haven't done as much as these people here either, but I did vote, and so I think it's important to vote, but I think it's also really important to vote in your local elections, which I will be more interested and in doing. And apart from voting, what else is on your mind, if given a chance, and if you had the time and money, what is it that you would like to do for your society? I think just becoming more involved. I think a lot of people brought up a lot of important ways that you could be involved, but it's true, you do need the time, you do need the money. There are a lot of things going on in everyone's lives and you can't just spend all your time being involved in government but I think it's important to definitely have that as a priority. Okay, if you could pass on the mic uh, to your left. Is it your priority that you spend some time for governance issues as well? Um, yeah, I definitely think that people do need to take a significant portion of their time to focus on the issues that are, addre that are addressing our nation, both of our nations and it really has to stem out from a local level as everybody here has been saying and um, I do think it's very important. Okay, Professor Timothy, what is the level of participation we expecting from the citizens? They can do whatever they want. I think one of the things, it sounds so idealistic, but I think one of the great things about democracies, particularly large, diverse democracies, <laughs> is that the power is there available to be gotten by the people. One of the reasons that certain interests control societies like the United States and India is that young people and other people don't actually take the levers that are in their hands. They have to vote. They have to participate <coughs> in groups that try to push politicians one direction or another. It's too easy to say, oh, well, it's complicated and other people are in charge. Other people are in charge because they have grabbed hold of the tiller and they are moving the ship in the direction they wish it to be moved in. Okay, and if people really want to move it in another direction, they have to spend a lot of energy trying to move it. Okay, power is never given, power is taken. Allegation, we are not using or leveraging our power enough. I think it's very easy to say that the youngsters do not participate, but there's no effective link through which the youngsters are uh, capable of participating. And what could be that link? Uh, regarding this, first of all, I would like to address the issue that in India, still the whistleblowers are not allowed. There, there is no provision to safeguard their rights. Uh, in any state, uh, if any of the people, they just uh, hold any uh, demonstrations, public demonstrations, it is not uh, even uh, reached to the uh, okay. officials. Professor Bhattacharya, somebody is ready to blow, blow the whistle, but, uh, but probably they are fair. See, only two sets of people or institutions in India whistle, uh, blow the whistle, the media and the civic society, non-government organizations. Sometimes they become effective. You know, the recently some of the media um, highlighting forced the police judiciary to take up some of the cases. So it's not that always they don't do, but media people do, do not feel effectively, you know, uh, power to interact directly to the politicians. So media and civic society are the medium through which a typical democracy citizenship participates. And nothing wrong about it. I think that's a very effective way. Right. One of the other solutions <coughs> would be the landmark RTI. Do you think the uh, Right to Information Act uh, is being used 
very optimally, very effectively by youngsters, everyone? Used as well as misused. <laughs> but even if you get an information, <clears throat> what power do you have to change the system? Okay. Now, I'll give an example. New Delhi municipality <clears throat> had a lot of uh, ghost employees drawing salaries, citizens paying taxes to pay salaries. Everybody talked about it. Okay? But what power do you have to change? Okay. Finally came the technology of biometric identification. They've discovered that as many as 30 or 40,000 such people don't exist. Now that is highlighted in the court. Then court ordered the municipality, look here, you have no right to collect taxes to pay salaries to the ghost employees. So you need to go to an institution which has the authority to force the polity. Okay. So right to information is the first step to get information. Next step is an institution to force the polity to correct itself. Okay, Professor Timothy, the citizen may get the information, but that's not where the things end. Where's the power of change? Well, one of the things that's really interesting that's happening in our country, and I'm sure in India as well, is an explosion of information and media outlets on the internet. We used to rely on a very few institutions, television networks and newspapers, and we couldn't really trust them completely to fight the government on our behalf. And now you have all sorts of people and all sorts of groups communicating on the internet. Now, we all know a lot of that is, is just but a lot of it isn't junk and it takes some time to find independent sources of information on the internet that now can use this information to try to oppose the government in ways that I think were never happening before and I think young people are very involved in that in the sense that everyone can start their own newspaper tomorrow if they want. <laughs> so you talked about young people's involvement in conclusion Professor Timothy what's the need of people's participation to what level you want people participating for effective governance and what's your solution for it? I think it's very important for people to communicate with their neighbors their fellow students whoever they might happen to be and try to organize themselves into the sort of civic groups the professor was talking about that not only gives them a greater voice but it also gives them an inspiration to each other that when people meet outside of their private lives and they come together and express their interests that has a way of fortifying their future participation. Okay you mentioned about hundred percent voting if you could tell me your opinion, should voting be made mandatory? Raise your hands who believe yes. Should voting be made mandatory, say in America and US, and that ensures 100% voting? No one. So what's the way then? So we can't do it by law. Then how do we get from 50 to 100? Well, if I knew that, we'd be at 100. But one of the things you have to do is to give people an incentive to vote. Someone said before, some people don't vote because they think everyone is all the same. And what you need to do is to encourage politicians to be very forthright about what they intend to do, the sort of things we were talking about, so that people have an incentive to vote. Because if you're just choosing between that thing and this thing, and they're both for, that, you know, for the same thing, then why bother to go out and vote? But if you have clearly defined candidates and parties who are putting forward distinct positions and distinct futures for the country, that's the way I think you get people. The one incentive for voting for them I have seen in U.S. campuses for registration, somebody will be carrying a basket of oranges and offering to one. Maybe some of you have used that to put your name in the registration list, yes. The effective governance requires is a two-way process of accountability. Uh, both the candidates elected and the citizens they both be made equally accountable. Citizens' negligence of voting, there should be some accountability for that. Citizens also blindly voting without bothering the candidates' issue is a negligence on the part of citizen to exercise democratic rights. Similarly, the elected representatives must make it very clear what they stand for. And next time they choose to come for election, they must explain before the citizens what they have done. Okay, final word to the public since we're talking about public involvement, penultimate voice, yes? Uh, I think one of the things that can be done like uh, now today is setting up an internet forum. Like we have social networking sites where we can interact with celebrities. If we can interact with celebrities, why not interact with uh, politicians on a uh, familiar level? Okay, final words. Elias, we started with you. The cycle is almost complete from food to food. <laughs> Yes. We're all here, we're talking about effective governments, governance, but the most important thing is to get our peers who aren't as passionate about effective governments to vote. I mean, it's all about reaching out and starting this chain reaction, so maybe we'll never get that 100% that Professor Burns was talking about, but we certainly can try and it can start right here on the stage. This Youth Express 
has been a very passionate forum where your views are very, very appreciated. And on that passionate note, we'd like to thank our guest, Professor Bhattacharya. Thank you so much for joining us. And Professor Timothy, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the lively, youthful audience. Thank you very much for your intriguing questions and opinions. Thanks a lot.